So just a quick check. Who here has visited uh, LoveTube? We have one, we have two, we have three. Great. Who wants to visit the LoveTube? Great, nice to see. Um, so we're IC Space, isolated, confined, extreme environment uh, space company. We're located actually in the Netherlands, but also located all over the world because our team members are located all over the world, which we will tell you more about. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders, I'm Charlotte Pauls, and this is Mark Heemskerk. Uh, just to give a short introduction to who I am, uh, I started the analog journey like most of you guys at High Seas as a Euro Mars MS2 uh, mission uh, back in 2019. Then I became a stand speaker and ambassador to promote space and to promote why analog missions are important here on Earth. In the meantime, I was working at Airbus Defensive Space because to get the money in, I work at satellite systems. Um, so I studied physics and then I went to space engineering. So I speak both the science language as the engineering <laughs> language. Um, and then I went further and switched careers to CGI space, which is the European Galileo satellite system, also commonly known as GPS, but then for Europe. And in the meantime, I just really like to do diving, like extreme diving, wreck diving, um, try to diving, like all of that. Sailing, because I grew up in the Netherlands, you need to have a boat, otherwise you can drown almost. Um, and bouldering and just lots of other additional things to do. And I'll give the word to Mark to introduce himself. Yeah, so I think I indeed forgot to do it the uh, last presentation. So I'm uh, Mark Heemskerk, I'm sometimes also going by the name Mr. Lava Tube Guy. Um, that's mainly because of my fascination with lava tubes. Um, for the rest, I'm an earth scientist and exogeologist, which means that I like to talk to rocks, I like to lick rocks, and I like to get stuck in rocks. Over there, I'm stuck in the rocks in uh, Iceland. Um, I've also been stuck in rocks in Hawaii, um, in I think almost 20 countries already now in the world. Um, so as I already mentioned, I was part of a, an EMIS mission at high seas as well, where I was the lead scientist uh, for two weeks at Lunar Analog. Um, and I'm the founder of the Chill Ice mission and co-founder of IC Space. Okay, great. So yeah, just a quick uh, recaption why we're going to the moon and the difference between going to lava juice and just going to the lunar soil. So, as you all know, Artemis is returning in 2025 uh, to the moon, setting up all their systems. And for example, the HLS of SpaceX is one of the major features that will get us there and actually will make sure that uh, we have a sounding base. But that's not for long term. We need to start thinking long term. It's not about the next five years, the next 10 years, it's about what will we do in the next 50 years, at least in my lifetime. Um, so that's why we're investigating into lava tubes, because they already offer a shelter for our lunar habitats, and they offer a protection against radiation, which Mark will tell more about later on. Um, and of course, as you all know, the new space sector has grown exponentially. It's not only NASA, it's not only ESA, it's not only um, all the other agencies in the world, it's also the commercial parties. So there has been a large investment into space, um, like up 55% from the global space economy in 2020 already. I do not want to know where we're at right now. So I'm looking forward to this prospect in the next upcoming years. So about us explicitly, so IC Space is an international space test research and development company. We're trying to establish the next iteration of inflatable habitats inside lava juice, but also test augmented reality systems inside spacesuits, conduct astrobiology, geology research, and art, because it's also an important part. And we will show you some artwork uh, that we collaborated with, with the Chill Ice Mission and with IC Space uh, in the last two years. Uh, so, as Mark already said, July stands for the construction of a lunar analog habitat inside a lava tube. And uh, we're mainly focusing on the Chile's mission for now, but we're looking to expand. So, as you see, we're currently focused mainly in Iceland. That's where we had our first successful analog mission last year. Very happy with that result. Uh, and we're looking to expand to other sites. So, these are currently the sites of our interest. But if you have a country that has lava tubes or other cave systems that may be of interest to us, uh, or you're interested in setting up a lava tube or analog inflatable habitat inside your country, just let us know and we will see if there is a collaboration possibility. Um, so our growth roadmap, 
as Mark mentioned, he started in July, uh, with July in 2019, with an ESA campaign. Um, we just further along that we first started only doing the science and the engineering, and later on we noticed that we needed export documents, we needed import documents. They requested a tax number. We're like, crap, we're scientists, we don't have that, <laughs> so we need a company. And that's where we founded um, IC Space uh, to successfully deploy the Chill Ice uh, One mission. Uh, that happened in August last year. And this year, August, we will return to Iceland to do our second mission. So, of course, we're just not with the two of us. You cannot only have a scientist and a scientist engineer. You also need designers, artists, um, like business people. So we have 28 people over 16 countries. And these are people uh, working on the Canadian Space Arm, working for the ISS, uh, working at ESTEC, uh, working all over the world from the Australian Space Agency to, to Chile, to like all over the place. And these people are like the frontiers of inspirational people that are driving not only the analog community, but also the space community forward. So I'm very excited and very happy to work with this team every day, 24-7, because we really work all around the clock. <laughs> uh, so now Mark, with further ado, we'll talk about lava tubes. Yes, because as I already mentioned, lava tubes are freaking amazing. Um, so Charlotte mentioned already some of the benefits of actually going into lava tubes, especially on the lunar and later on also the Martian surface. Um, it's not just the protection from the meteorites or from the radiation, it's also thermal insulation um, because as I think most of you will know there's about 350 Kelvin degrees um, of fluctuation over the lunar surface at the equatorial plane, um, which actually is, and I'm not even an engineer but I noticed that it eventually will put strains on the alloys that you're using to actually build your habitat just because of the growing and the shrinking um, let alone of course all the other processes such as the, the, the the radiation or the micrometeorite impacts. But also another very fun result of all those billions of years of those very harsh environments on the lunar surface makes it we have the regolith on the surface as well. Regolith can be very nice, can be very useful as well because it contains a lot of nutrients, um, but at the same time, because it's so fine, because of the enormous surface area, uh, it also has a lot of reaction potential which means that if you breathe in the regolith, um, then you will very uh, badly end up with some uh, carcinogens in your lungs um, and also other kinds of uh, soft tissue damage. Um, I actually worked with uh, a simulant of lunar regolith once uh, and I was not wearing my face mask properly. I was doing face masks before COVID. Ha! Um, and eventually I started coughing up blood. So please don't try this at home or on the moon. Um, it's better to be safe and away from the regolith. And because we know that this regolith has formed uh, over time due to these um, surface processes, one of the ways to avoid it almost completely is to by going into the subsurface and therefore away from all these sort of problems. Um, and another sort of special thing which uh, I sometimes also encounter is people saying, well, why do you want to be in a lava tube? Because then you would e every day have to move outside of your lava tube to go to your research or your place of interest. And it's going to be very hard to move a cave to the place where you want to be for your research. And I think it's the exact opposite. Because if you're inside the lava tube, which has formed over three and a half billion years ago, you're exactly at the place where you want to be to do your research, especially on the Martian surface um, where because of those harsh environments on the surface it's going to be very hard to find any sort of complete data sets of very ancient time periods such as 3.5 3.8 billion years ago from for example the Noachian um, whereas inside those lava tubes because it's such a pristine such a protected environment these minerals these elements that you will find on the inside of the lava tube will be the exactly same as they were formed three and a half 3.8 maybe even four billion years ago so those are exactly exactly the places where you want to look. Um, so why are we going to Iceland? Um, well, first of all, Iceland is a very cool country, especially for Earth, us Earth scientists. Uh, there are active volcanoes, there are glaciers, there are lava tubes, lava fields, you have very strong winds, you have oceanic currents coming together there. Um, but of course, our main thing was the lava tubes and the geochemical composition. Because I've done some tests as well um, to study the geochemical composition of those lava tubes, and they have about 95 to 98% major and minor elemental 
equal position match to the lunar Mars uh, results. Um, so if you want to do some further ISRU studies as to how we can utilize the rocks, how we can utilize the uh, elements that you basically find inside those lava tubes, um, Iceland is one of the best places to go to. Um, so this is the lava tube there we went last year, which is called the Stefans Hetlier lava tube. It's called. Uh, it's located in the Havelmundergrön lava field, which is at the western side of Iceland. For those of you who are not familiar with the Havelmundergrön lava field yet, um, and this year we are actually going into the sister cave of the Stefans Hetlier, which is called Surts Hetlier, um, and we should be very lucky because there usually lives a troll inside, which is uh, also called a fire giant. Um, it's apparently not around this year, so hopefully we will be safe or at least our astronauts will be safe um, and well one of the reasons why we are hoping not to encounter the troll is also because of the way that we set up our whole mission um, because we are not like for example high seas or MDRS or even DMARS where there's a separate base already there on location um, we are actually doing one mission per year and we are hosting our complete mission uh, depending on our mission needs, depending on what our researchers are looking for. So if there is a researcher coming to us and saying, okay, I have a very cool research that I want to do, but for that I need the mission to be exactly seven days, we can actually do that. We can make our whole mission to whatever our researchers or our partners require. Um, and that also means that for the environment, we are putting a lot less stress on it. Because we are going into the cave, we are deploying our habitat, we're doing our mission, and eventually we pick up our habitat, we pick up of course also our astronauts whether they're alive or not um, and we transport them back to earth and we leave the cave in the exact same way that we found it we are trying not to be uh, intrusive in any way so we're not drilling holes into the lava tube we are not taking rock samples or at least not more than we need to be this year we are only going to do in situ resource uh, research so we will not be taking any rock samples from those Icelandic caves because they are protected environments and I sincerely hope that once we get to the lunar and the Martian surface we will treat those caves in the exact same way as protected environments not damaging them and leaving them as they should be okay. and then we have a short video as well um, which is showing the inside of the uh, the last part so to say of the seven settler cave um, so as you can see it's about 65 meters deep it's about seven meters high and about 18 meters wide and over there is the uh, the eastern end so the, actually the beginning of the the whole lava tube system here because the lava was coming from the east um, yeah and this was just a video that was made by one of our collaborators. He was working with LiDAR and drone imagery uh, to actually make a full 3D model of the cave, uh, which we are also using to train our astronauts. Because just like on the lunar surface, our astronauts will not be inside the cave or have not been inside those caves ever before they're actually doing their analog mission there. Because, well, on the moon, you can also not know exactly what it is going to be like. You're not visiting the cave, uh, doing your practice rounds there, and eventually come back a year later or so to actually build the habitat no you are using the maps that were provided by you by robotics or by lidar or by drones or whatever and you're actually using that information to your benefit to actually make eventually the whole mission go so um, one of our main goals for this year's mission so again it will happen in august it's going to be a six-day mission so we will be um, simulating or at least our scenario is that there is already a lunar base uh, which is a larger base which will be manned by our backup astronauts for this year and from that base we are traveling into a lava tube setting up a temporary habitat over there again in simulation so the astronauts will literally have to carry the whole habitat uh, while wearing spacesuits but also the solar panels also the better packages also the expendables such as food and water well again being in simulation so in their spacesuits um, and eventually doing a six-day research mission over there which is mainly focused on robotics and robotic cooperation that's also because of our strong collaboration with the Euro Moon Mars group which I was talking about earlier um, so to see how humans can operate with robots and cooperate with them uh, to do for example parts of exploration tasks which are either too dangerous or too mundane for humans to do on a regular basis and then the humans can stay safely inside their habitat inside the lava tube and have the robots for example go out onto the surface 
So this is uh, the MCC of Chill Ice One. This is just a, a part of the team. Not everybody was here, um, but this was during one of our training sessions. So um, most of the astronauts are in this picture as well. Uh, and also some photographers, uh, videographers, uh, and some marketing people just to make sure that we actually uh, get the outreach also that this project deserves. And I will give, uh, I see that technology is on the board, so I'll give it back to the scientist slash engineer because I'm only a scientist. Thank you, Mark. Um, so as you, as you all know, lava tubes are sharp. And setting up an inflatable structure in a lava tube, hazardous. Um, so we developed together with uh, the KPU, the university in Vancouver in Canada, the ECHO habitat, which is the inflatable deployable space habitat. It has space for three people, just about, and I guess you all have seen your living quarters, at least I hope you spent the night there. Um, it's about that size, and that's also including the airlock parts. <laughs> And the airlock part also has an integrated bathroom system um, and where you can also pee and do your poo. Um, and that's also a little bit tricky right now because the analog astronauts reported some smells and noises that they could hear <laughs> from each other while going to the bathroom. So we're looking into making it more ergonomic and more friendly for our future astronauts and not only seeing it from the engineering uh, perspective. Um, so one of the things that we will be doing this year is actually going with the rovers around the habitat to inspect for future leakages. And we can do this using LiDAR mappages, uh, mapping, but also just observing um, and mapping the whole outside of the inflatable habitat structure. And this is because during our second mission last year, uh, there were some reports about uh, leakages that they had to fix during an EVA. We, of course, want to prevent our analog astronauts being in a danger of not having their oxygen supply or losing pressure. Uh, so that's why the rover system would go around the habitat and inspect it, especially during the night, uh, to see for any hazardous points. Um, so as we mentioned, we're also looking really forward into the development of the next generation of spacesuits, specifically for the moon, which has like one-sixth of gravity, uh, and future for uh, Martian uh, spacesuits. So currently we worked with uh, Astronaut Space Agency, which is an analog facility in the northern part of Spain. They also have their own K system, but it's only one cave. It doesn't, it's, it's not really an integrated lava tube system. It's a karst um, cave as well. It's a closed cave, yeah. Karst. Karst? Karst cave, Karst. yeah. Karst. Limestone. Kar Limestone. Yeah. Okay. Very, very different. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they offer, because they have already like a suit developed for like the mobility for inside the cave, and we needed something similar. So we tested out their suits inside lava tubes, but we kind of figured out that there's a lot of fogging issues, uh, especially because you're moving downhill and uphill, so we're trying to improve that, and hopefully this year we have Paul Buck and his warp suits, uh, which are also being tested at Lunaris uh, from Lashek. Um, and one of the biggest improvements that we're doing this year, I'm sure it's on the next slide, yeah, is uh, together with Texas A&M in uh, College Station uh, near Houston, and together with the NASA SUS team and the International Space University, I'm conducting a research about augmented reality systems, so a heads-up display inside spacesuits. And as most of you guys know, adding electrical and additional systems inside a space helmet is not really preferred, especially with the claustrophobic feeling and additional fogging that happens. Um, actually, I'm going to test something out today, so if you're interested in helping Helping me with the test, it's like the alpha beta testing. Um, just come over to me uh, after I've reached out to Paul. We first get things set up. Another thing is because we're not only focusing on space systems, of course we're mainly focusing on space systems, but uh, we also develop PFAS, and PFAS is our photovoltaic energy system and communication system inside lava tubes. So this is a standalone solar panel uh, transformator with the communication system that works by itself. So even if you're living in Africa, or you're living in the outback of Australia, or you're living somewhere here in the desert of America, you could get the system, deploy it, and you would have straight connection, you would have straight power, and you would be sufficient at least for the first three days. That was with, last mission, with the last mission. For this year, we're going to improve it up to seven days, but it also depends up to the location that you're at, because in Iceland, there is not that much of like sunlight, so it's around 300 watts that you generate per day. So if you're in a desert here, you may be lucky with more power. 
Um, another thing is, as I mentioned, we're not only doing the engineering and the science, we're also collaborating with our researchers um, who are also an artist. Um, so one of the artist exhibitions that we work with is the Moon Gallery. And the Moon Gallery actually was launched to the International Space Station just a few months ago. So whoo, for the next 64 artists who actually sent their artwork up to space. And as you can imagine, it has a cost. So they were only allowed to send up to one by one by one centimeters. Sorry for the distortion with the with that. And one of the artists, Mary Kuiper, also a Dutch person, just like two of us, um, got the hair that she made, the horse hair from the right image, um, uh, from Iceland, from the horses there, because it's one of the purest Icelandic uh, horse races that you can find out there. And if you're an artist and you're interested to sending your artwork to space or even to the moon, they're looking still for like 30 artists who want to send their artwork to the moon. So if you're interested in that, please follow the Moon Gallery. They're on social media. You can find them everywhere. Uh, they're mainly based in Europe, but they're also in the US doing some visits. Actually, the launch was with SpaceX, I believe, uh, with NanoRx. So that's also the casing that you see over there. This is an actual image of the cupola where the artwork was uh, taken. So then we're going to show you guys a video that was made with our partner, GoPro. Um, if somebody can press play, or can I press play? I can press play. Oh. Right. he needed some samples. And it's also a great way to test procedures. Uh, so we made procedures for the analog astronauts to follow. We see how clear they are, and especially the humanity part in that, because I can write a system procedure, but somebody else may totally not understand that. So this is a good interaction to field test that out. As you also saw, it is quite a close, confined space. Um, so the guys, the, the girls and the guys, because we had a mixed crew, uh, the first team had two guys, one girl, and the second crew had two girls, one guy. They both did an astonishing job. Uh, they were very experienced people with diving, analog astronaut missions, and like a great background. 
Um, so our unique selling point, at least, um, is that we are a flexible, modular company. Just like similar like Hypernauts, we can go anywhere in the world, set up our system, and future improve it. So we're looking to make our inflatable habitat even more pressurized, um, and getting our sensors in there, and even get the whole inflation process automated. But of course, for that, we need additional investors, uh, business angels, and sponsors uh, to get the technology where we want it to go. Um, because we're also a research facility, we also n write numerous papers. You can find us at the IAC, you can find us at GLEC, at the EPSC conferences, and at the Analog Astronaut Conference from now on to present our work and our research results uh, in numerous papers, conference papers, and abstracts. So, if you want to be part of the next mission, if you're a researcher, or if you're a sci like a scientist, if you're an engineer, if you want to become a chillized analog astronaut, if you are an artist who wants to conduct artwork, if you're a filmmaker, please get in touch with us. You can apply uh, via the QR code, so you can scan it there. And our chillized 2 mission patch is ready out there now. You can also uh, sponsor us if you donate more than 20 euros on our crowdfunding page for like 20 yours is like $22 something, you can get a mission patch and you will support the mission and the crew. Um, so the mission will happen in August and the reason why we're doing it in August in Iceland is because Iceland has a lot of snow, <laughs> which means that our latitudes are 11 months, like 10, 11 months of the year are completely filled up with snow. And unless you want to dig yourself in there, you have to wait for the month of August to come up. Um, and we were going there. So this year we will focus for six days and five nights. As Mark said, the mission costs are around 1,500 euros per person and the deadline for the application is the 10th of May. And we chose this date because it gives you a little bit of time after the Analog Astronaut Conference to still apply. Uh, so we're really looking forward to your application, either as an engineer, as an artist, as a filmmaker, uh, or as an analog astronaut. Um, so I also want to point out, as Emily's company is also featured here, she is working with us, uh, at, with her company, Interstellar Performance Lab. She will actually be monitoring the crew cohesion, uh, the crew dynamics, and making sure that they are fit and at the right level where we want them to be for the mission. Because surviving in a lava tube, it sounds it may be easy, but it completely isn't. You're dehydrated, you're a lack of food because you're living on dry freeze meals, you're completely isolated from the light. Uh, only when you're conducting EVA, you will go out on the surface and maybe experience some sunlight, but for the rest of the time, you're in complete darkness. Um, so this is very important research, so we're very happy to collaborate with Emily on this uh, and with our other partners. So our key partnerships are the commercial partnerships, the universities, the research groups, and as I mentioned before, the public and the crowdfunding, but also the analog astronaut and space community, because they teach us what we need to improve. They teach us what we can add as a value, and they keep us sharp and have this humanity connection part of it to it, what is very important. Uh, also, we want to thank our partners from the Chill Ice 1 mission and for the Chill Ice 2 mission because our partners continue their collaboration with us. We're very excited and very happy with that. Um, okay, next slide. If you want as a sponsor package and if you have a brand that you would like to get promoted on there, on the t-shirts, on the merchandise or on the outreach, uh, because we're covered over 16 countries, there's a lot of outreach to be gathered. Uh, you can go into one of our sponsor packages. Um, we have some business people who can tell you more about that. <laughs> and then I would like to let Mark finish up with a very important quote. Yeah, so that's the, the quote of our mission, um, is to going from into the earth to into the universe. And yeah, please apply as well for the analog astronautics. And you can just scan the QR code. You can also just get in touch with us, uh, get one of our cards. And I think we have still two minutes left for our after movie. Yes, okay. Please go ahead and play the after movie as well. Produce the movie? Um, yeah, so this movie was made by our, uh, our mission videographer, uh, Jamal Gehli from uh, Germany, uh, and he also entered a competition uh, from Röde with it. Um, and it's a little bit of a dramatized version of how it actually went in the mission, but at the same time when I look back at this video, um, 
when we got the call that the mission actually managed to set up all the different individual components, setting up the habitat uh, within those eight hours of their EVA time that they had um, after about seven hours and seven minutes, um, we did have that same sort of feel of yeah, out of this world kind of accomplishment. Um, I'm still not sure how we did it, but we did it. And two days later, we did it again. So yeah, um, very happy to share with you this video.